Welcome and thank you for tuning into this week's life-changing message from the Equipping Church. We pray you are empowered and encouraged by the Word of God. change the script in a moment. I know a God who can change the narrative. I don't care what the narrative of the world is. I serve a God who wrote the stars in the sky. I serve a God who stepped off his throne, came to earth, hung on a cross, and came out of an empty tomb. Come on. Is there a people this morning who serve a risen God? Hallelujah. 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 We're going to do things a little bit different this morning. I'm going to introduce uh, Amanda this morning who's going to come and share about what's going on in in the nation that she serves. But I want to read a scripture to you before I do that. Uh, Before you take your seats, I want you to stand for the reading of the word this morning as I read this. For the scripture says in Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Verse 13, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But verse 14 is the key here. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. In the house this morning, we have one who brings good news of good things to a nation that is largely unreached. And so Amanda's going to come and she's going to share about what God is doing in the nation that she is called to. And so will you welcome Amanda this morning? Jai Masiki, that means praise the Lord. Merinam Amanda Hu, may I'm trying to speak in my Hindi and it's not coming clearly. May America say who, like in Abi, India, or Jaipur, may reheti who. My name is Amanda and I am from America, but I serve in India in Nepal. And Jai Masiki means praise the Lord. Um, so praise the Lord for what he is doing. <clears throat> so a little bit of my story I wanted to share with you guys before we get started here is God called me um, in 2005 to go to the, to the nations. And it took a 10-year journey of I felt like walking through the wilderness, but God was doing something in my heart. He was helping me hear his voice. He was doing a surgery inside of me that I needed. Um, And when he revealed to me that I was to go to India, I stepped off the plane and I knew, I said, this is home. I was like, God, this is home. How can I stay here for long term? Um, And I've been there ever since for seven years. I stepped foot in India in 2015 and I, I'm still serving today. Um, And my, I I love what the Lord says. He says, you know, kind of how I live my life is he says, love God, um, love others, and let them be known. Um, Let them know him. Let them uh, come to know him. Some things that I've gotten to do in India while being there is I've gotten, I really have a heart for justice um, and My verse um, is Isaiah 61. It's kind of my life verse, and that's kind of how I live in India and Nepal. It says, uh, Isaiah 61, 1 and 3, it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn, and provide those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the joy of the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair, that they will be called oaks of righteousness, a year of the Lord's splendor, 
And I just really, um, God has really put it on my heart how to live this out. And I really have gotten to see this, to see the captives set free, to see how God is opening those doors. I partnered and have been partnering with uh, two ladies that uh, work in the trafficking industry, and they actually set people free. They go in and they raid, and they say, Hi, how can we get them into uh, you know, homes um, from rescuing them, and how can we um, then share the love of Jesus with them? Um, I got I get to meet with these ladies uh, on a weekly basis and uh, really encourage them. Um, how do you share God uh, with people that don't know? How do you become strong in your faith when you're faced with um, such pushback in India? Um, and so it's just amazing to see what God and the work that he's doing with these ladies. We would meet every Friday, um, and we would pray. For two years, we did this. Every Friday, we would meet, and we began to see um, the doors open. We began to see them have favor at these government homes. We began to see how they would be able to go in and actually present people with the gospel and give them Bibles in a government home that is not even, uh, that's not even allowed. Um, but God has favor upon them, um, and they have boldness to go in to proclaim the gospel. <clears throat> um, this family here, this is one of my families that I got to walk with. Um, there are some familiar faces you might see in that picture. Um, but this family, uh, it's a family that was set free. If you've read in the Bible, Mark 5, you've read about the demoniac. And one of the five sisters um, from this family, she was possessed. And they, had, they were trying to take her to the temple. And they took her to the temple and they said, please help, my daughter is sick. We don't know what to do. So they did their ceremonies and she came back and she didn't get better. She actually got worse. They took her to another place of worship, um, and they said, please help my daughter. She's getting worse. We don't know what to do. She's not in her right mind, and she got worse. And finally, someone came and told her uh, and the family, go to the church. Take her to the church, and she will be set free. They took her to the church, and she was set free in an instant. And then she became a believer. Half of her family became a believer, and then... The other part of her family were like, well, we have to believe if, you know, she's set free and in her right mind. Um, so all of the family is now believers. Um, and that's what I really believe is today it's not picking one out of a crowd to know Jesus. It's whole f households. Um, it's, it's a, it, I, I always pray and I say, may it be families of peace. May it be households of peace that we're looking for in India and in Nepal and in the Middle East, wherever we are. May it be households that get saved because that's, if you look in scripture, it was the jailer and his whole household. It was Lydia and her whole household. It wasn't just individuals. Um, so that's what we're really believing for. I got to walk with this family and teach them, hey, you get to go, you have a story we, we sang about that earlier. You have a story that God has set you free. Go share your story. Go in. We get to empower them. Go share your story with other people. Um, and it's just so exciting to see these women where women don't have value there, um, but they're empowered to go and to share their story, to go and to share the gospel, to pray and lay hands on the sick and see the sick healed and see the demon set free. Um, it doesn't matter, man or woman, um, boy or girl. Um, and I love how God, um, his promises are yes and amen. Um, his promises, I'm still believing things right now for India and Nepal and South Asia of what God's going to do. And I'm going to continue to contend for those things, just like we're uh, contending for revival right now. We haven't seen it. We're on the cusp of it. We're going to continue to believe for it. Um, when I'm in India um, and Nepal and uh, we're getting to pray for people and we're getting to see people set free, we also get to see the body of, of the church um, come together and be trained and to be equipped and to be sent out. Um, 
it's just so beautiful when we get to do these trainings and you see people that have walked and traveled for a day or two to get to a training because they're so hungry. Um, just recently in May, um, we were able to see a training. I've been praying for trainings for five years. I've never been a part of a training, um, but it was finally able to be a part of a training. And what we got to do is equip them on, hey, you have a powerful story. Um, we want to teach you how to go and share it. You, God has a powerful story, and he, he wants you to go share his story with those that need it. Um, we got to empower them of how to pray for the sick and see the sick healed, how to pray for the one that, you know, is demon-possessed and see them set free and then send them out um, for the glory of the Lord. And so I have this video um, on here. Oh, oh no. Ah, okay. Um, so this video is just a small clip of them worshiping and glorifying the Lord and lifting his name high. Um, the song that they're singing is like, you are the king of kings. We're going to glorify and magnify your name. And it's not just about teachings that uh, is happening in India of how to spread the gospel, but it's actually Holy Spirit doing a work in them. Just like you're contending for revival here, you're contending for revival in your heart. You're wanting the presence of God to be manifested in you and in this city and in this state and in this nation. It's happening halfway around the world. So it's exciting that what's happening here, what you're contending for here, it's happening all over the world. So this is just a clip I wanted to share with you of just seeing people worshiping in another language, worshiping God, the same God that we worship here, they're worshiping there. So just um, enjoy. just a glimpse of what's happening there is what's happening here. Um, I have some scriptures I want to leave you with. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the ancient days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. We want Jesus to come back, but Jesus cannot come back because he said, Every tribe, tongue, nation, and language will come and bow before his throne. And not every, every tribe, tongue, nation, and language has had a chance to know of him. Right now, I just want to leave you with this statistic um, so you can know what you're going to be praying for. Is there are 1.6 billion people in all of India and only 3% are Christian. Only 3% know Jesus. That's a small amount out of 1.6 billion people, not just 100, not just a million, but billion people, only 3% know. So this 
this, we want Jesus to come back. I want Jesus to come back, but he's not coming back now because we need every tribe, tongue, nation, and language to hear the name Jesus proclaimed. Then he will come back. So, Jai Masiki, if y'all will, I'm going to teach you how to say Jai Masiki. It's really easy because it's praise the Lord, and then you'll know another language. Um, so if you can say Jai, Jai. Masi, Ki. So you just put it all together. Jai Masiki. So I will say it to you, and you say it back to me. Jai Masiki. Jai Masiki. Praise the Lord. Amen. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Here's what we're going to do. We'll receive our tithes and offerings later, but we're going to take a special offering right now to sow into Amanda and what God is doing in India and Nepal. And uh, I don't think I prepared the ushers for that. Sorry, y'all. Um, but this is what we're going to do. I want you to, to take just a second and ask the Lord, how much do I sow into uh, Amanda and this ministry to India? We, we get to partake. That's the incredible thing about sowing is that when we sow, we get to partake of the harvest that's happening in her life. We get to be part of that harvest. And how many of you want to see a harvest in the nations? Come on. 48,000 Christians in India. That's it. That's what 3% is. 48,000. That's less than what lives in Bryan. I mean, let's see the nation of India saved. Come on. Man, is anyone saved in this room this morning? It, it, do we need to just have an altar call here first before we try to take an offering for India? Like, are you saved this morning? Anyone saved this morning? Who wants to see India saved? Hallelujah. All right. Listen, the buckets are going to come around. The, the, the bucket, I was going to say the Indians are going to come around. The buckets are going to come around. Here's the Indian right here. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. You can give online. Uh, there is a spot that says missions. Anything that comes in for missions today, we'll make sure it goes to, to Amanda. And we will be supporting Amanda. Can we get the, the giving slide up, the, the text to give? It should be there. There we go. So you can text give uh, to 979 um, and listen, we will be supporting Amanda on a monthly basis. And so if you feel led to partner in that above your tithes and offerings and you want to uh, partner specifically, uh, you can set up recurring giving even online uh, to do that. But uh, hallelujah. You know, I just love what the Lord is doing in the nation. So uh, as the buckets come around, if you'll bring that up to me, Suzanne, I want to pray over it. And uh, let's believe God to, to meet all of Amanda's needs. Uh, she's here in the States uh, doing uh, her partnership raising because uh, she does have a monthly budget that she has to meet there. And so we want to be part of helping her do that. Amen. Oh, Susanna's running. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, it's still coming. Hallelujah. Yep. All right. Oh, here it comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning for Amanda and the ministry to India and Nepal. And Father, we thank you that you uh, would make all grace abound toward her. And that, Father, you would provide in ways that she would just be blown away. And Father, we thank you that as the equipping church, we get to partner with her. And we thank you for an abundant harvest in India and Nepal. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it is good to be home. I was in Florida this week with... Uh, Bishop Dino Graham and Life Church, and uh, God did some incredible things. I'll share a couple uh, short testimonies before we jump into the Word. My favorite, one of my favorite testimonies from the from the week, um, was there was a, a lady who was in her late eighties, who I prayed for at one point during the the ministry time, and she was standing over to the side crying, and they waved me over to her, and she said, "I just I just can't believe it." I can't believe it. I said, what? She said, I've waited my whole life to be healed from all of this trauma from my dad, and I'm healed tonight. In her late 80s, God healed her of all that trauma from her childhood. Come on. 
There was another lady. She had metal uh, from her hip down to her knee. And if I remember the story correctly, she'd broken her femur. And they'd had to put it all back together. And so her leg was noticeably three inches shorter than the other leg. And when she walked, she walked like this. Because it was so much shorter. Brought her up, prayed for her. The leg grew all the way out to where when she came back the next night, she was just walking totally normal, just totally normal, no pain. Another lady had a rod down the front of her her leg, and uh, the first night prayed for her, and she had this massive uh, bump of scar tissue that had developed there on the side. All of that went away, completely gone. Then the next night, the rod that you could still feel in the front started to melt and mend, uh, just kind of melt into her body. You could feel the rod just going completely away. Lots of deliverance, lots of uh, prophetic, uh, shifting the region, coming against religious spirits. Man, it was heavy, I'll tell you. Uh, if you watched any of the live stream, you saw I really had to war against this that religious territory. But God just really really moved, and so I'm so thankful to have a church that is willing to say, yes, go, but come back, right? And uh, I just, I love what what God is doing here. Sorry, I have a cough drop uh, because I was losing my voice during worship, so I'm trying to finish this cough drop as I get ready to preach. Hallelujah. All right, I want you to um, turn in your Bible and just hold it there to Exodus 14. Turn in your Bible to Exodus 14 and just hold it there. We're not going to jump there yet, Hector. Just uh, Hector's filling in back there at the computer this morning. And uh, so good luck, Hector. Um, pray for him. I want to uh, do something a little bit different than when I normally do. If you know me, I, I typically will preach a series, you know, going after certain things. But uh, several weeks ago, some of you were here on a Wednesday night when I shared a dream that I had. And in the dream, uh, the late Benny Johnson uh, from Bethel Church. Anyone know who Benny Johnson is? Uh, So Benny passed away from cancer uh, back in July. And uh, in this dream, Benny walked into my office here at the church. And she had a set of keys that looked pretty identical to this. And she was waving them like this. And she was walking up to my desk. And she said, you won't know how to use the keys until you understand what 5783 means. And I looked at her and I said, what? Okay, Benny. I said, but why did you die of cancer? And she said, as long as you keep asking the wrong questions, you won't get the right answers. So rebuked me right there in the dream. Isn't that great? So I wake up from that dream And now I knew when I woke up what 5783 meant. 5783 is the Jewish New Year. Shana Tova, that's today. We're celebrating, today is Rosh Hashanah. It's the celebration of the Jewish New Year. Now, if you know me, I don't get into all the feasts and festivals. We we don't go back into all the the law and legalism of the Old Testament. We, We don't do any of that. And I typically don't even preach in this direction. But when I had that dream... I just really felt the Lord saying, okay, look it up, do some research. So I kind of ignored it, to be honest, that morning, because I I don't want to get into weird stuff. You know what I mean? So so I I, want to lay a foundation here of why we're headed this direction, because God does work on calendars. God does work on timetables. Uh, It it says of the sons of Issachar that they understood the times and the seasons. So we, we do need to understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. And so in the Jewish calendar... Uh, We are coming into the year 5783 today. So I I have this dream. I'm here at the church uh, later that day, and I'm getting ready to go get a haircut. And the Lord reminded me of the dream again. So I sat down and I I jotted down uh, some handwritten notes. I can show them to you uh, right here. Jotted down some notes that day. And I looked up a couple of things of what it meant. And I thought, oh, okay, well. And so I go to get a haircut. So I go get the haircut, and I had to go to a new place because I was changing barbers, and that's a whole nother story. And so when I go into the barber shop, uh, the guy says, hey, keys, cut his hair. (laughs) Okay, keys is going to cut my hair today. So I'm like, all right. So I sit down in the barber chair, and 
and it was the longest haircut I've ever had. He was uh, still in barber school, still learning how to fade, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this is going to take forever. It took two hours. What would normally take me like 30 minutes to get a haircut, I don't, I don't have a lot up there. So, you know, there, there's not a lot to work with, but it took two hours. So as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, well, I guess I better make some conversation with Keys since I just had this dream about Keys. And I said, how'd you get the nickname Keys? He says, well, as a little kid, I'd always find everyone's lost keys. Okay, well, divine appointment. The Lord's speaking to me about lost keys and using the keys. So that evening, I'm here at the church, and we're getting ready for Dig, our Wednesday night. And Shelly walks into my office with this set of keys. And she says, I was at Hobby Lobby, and I don't know if it's for a sermon illustration or what it's for, but I felt like I should get these for you. (laughs) Okay, Lord, you have my attention. I'm willing to be weird. And teach on whatever 5783 means and and whatever you want to say in this. So, I have that dream. I have that whole series of events. And I'll be honest, I kind of avoided it for a couple weeks. I'm like, I'm too busy to pay attention to this. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And the Lord just, I mean, everywhere I'd go, I started losing my keys. Couldn't, I mean, I, I couldn't find the Honda key to Anna's van. I lost her key. Thankfully, she has her own, but I'd lost my key. And so I'm starting to have this series of events with keys. And I'm like, okay, I get it. We'll, I, I will study. So we're in 20, 2022, right? Uh, according to our Gregorian calendar, we're in 2022. We're in the roaring 20s uh, in America because there's been a lot of roar. I mean, there has. There's lots of sound. There, I, I could preach a whole other message on that. But according to the Jewish calendar, we are in the decade of the 80s. Who's got their Aquanet? Like, we are in, anyone catch that? A few of you got it, okay. We're in the 80s in the Jewish calendar. And so that's the decade that we are in according to the Jewish calendar is the 80s. And so if we're looking at the 80s, I want to kind of give you some meanings before we get into what I believe the Lord is saying. All right, I want to lay a foundation. The number 80, or that decade, is the word pay. Say pay. Not P-A-Y, P-E-H. And the number three, we're in 5783, is the Hebrew word gamel. Okay, gamel. And so the letter pay, in Hebrew, there, there is, uh, it's called gematria. There's multiple layers to the meaning of what a number is. So there's a picture. So the Hebrew alphabet has pictures, and then it has meanings. And so the meaning or the picture that comes with 80 is the word mouth. It is the decade of the mouth. That is the decade that we are in. We're in the decade of pay, the mouth. What happened in 2020 when we entered into the decade of pay? The enemy wanted to cover our mouth. Okay, when we came into the decade of the 80s, the very first attack against the church was to shut the mouth of the church to cover the mouth, to hide our voice, to to muffle the church. So that's the very first thing that happened in the decade of the 80s. And so 5781, the, the one is the teeth. And so the enemy was looking to take away our bite, to steal our ability and to speak and to hide our mouth. 5782 was the truth. In 2022, how many of us have started seeing things come to light? I mean, I'm trying not to get political, but now the CDC is saying ivermectin is a good treatment for COVID, and they spent two years saying you can't take ivermectin. I mean, the truth is coming to the surface in many different areas, and so that's what 2022 has been all about. But then we get to 5783, and this is where things get interesting. So let me finish talking about the mouth. So Proverbs 18, 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue. This is what the Hebrew translation actually says. So how many of us have ever heard that? There's life and death in the power of the tongue. This is what the he- when it's really transliterated from the Hebrew, life and death are in the hands of our speech. Life and death are in the hands of our speech. So the decade of of the 80s for the church right now, life and death are in the hands of what we say. So if we're speaking death, we will have death. If we're speaking life, we will have life. And so pay comes after, in, in the order, it comes after the Hebrew word ayin, which is seeing. First you must see, then you must speak. 
So there's an order in the way that God's doing this. And so words have power that can elevate or they can be used to destroy. What we say and how we say things speaks a great deal, not only to how we are perceived, but how we, are, how we perceive ourselves. So this is a decade where we need to begin to see first, then speak. Before we speak, we better know what we see. So this is a prophetic message to the church. God speaks in times and seasons. What we say and how we say it does not go unnoticed by the enemy and by heaven. So the enemy is looking for what you're speaking. Because if he can get you to agree with what he wants you to speak, there's power in agreement. So both heaven and the enemy are taking notice of what we say and what we speak. This is a season where we need to watch our mouth. Pay also symbolizes holiness. So what does the Bible say? It's not what goes in that defileth a man, but what comes out that defileth a man. So what goes in doesn't have to take root. What we hear doesn't have to take root. But if it goes in and then comes out, we've become defiled. So the mouth is the rudder of holiness. That's what James says. The tongue is like a rudder, and it's difficult to tame. It's difficult to tame. So the, the mouth is the rudder of holiness in this decade. We've got to watch what we say. So then we come to the number three, gamel. This is what the number three represents. I love this, and you've got to catch it this morning. It represents a rich man running after a poor man to give him restitution. It represents a rich man running after a poor man to give him restitution. It means to deal out, to give. It means to have recompense or benefit that was due to you decades ago, but is coming into the now season. But here, here's how they work together. Because it's the decade of the mouth, what you say will determine your recompense either in blessing or in judgment. Because recompense isn't always blessing. Have you ever heard the term, you're getting what's coming to you? What you say will determine what you get. This is key. This is key. Pay means or I'm sorry, gamel means running the race with diligence because it's a picture of moving forward. It's a picture of going forward, going after. Here's where it gets wild. If you go online and you try to research this, see, I don't read other people's prophetic words until after I'm done. There's a lot of people out there saying a whole lot about 5783. I haven't read any of them. But if you really study it out, a lot of people in the Jewish community, thought this would be the year the Messiah returns. The reason is, is because three represents the kinsman redeemer. So in the book of Ruth, Ruth and her family, we, we start actually, we start with uh, uh, Naomi and her husband going where? Going over to another land that doesn't belong to them. And her, her sons die. And so then she and, and, and Ruth go back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. And Boaz, and there's this whole story of redemption and the kinsman redeemer. Three represents us coming into contact with the one who would catch us up. It means to be lifted up above the atmosphere. So there's a lot of people who would say, oh, this is the year of the rapture. No man knows the day or the hour, and we're not going to get into eschatology because you'd probably disagree with me anyways, and I'd stir up some religious devils. But here's what it has to do with. God wants to lift us up above the atmosphere in this year, but it's determined by what we say. And you've got to catch that. It's determined by what we say. So as I begin to really pray into this and to study it deeper, 80 is a symbol of prayer. It's a symbol of prayer. It means to, to pray without ceasing. 
Number three, this word gamel, it means to ripen, to reward, to nourish, to mature, to recompense, to move forward. 5782 was what was called a Shemitah year. So if you have any, any history in, in Jewish knowledge, a Shemitah is the ending of a cycle. We have come to the end of a seven-year cycle. 2022, for us, was the end of the first seven years, entering into our eighth year. Entering into a new beginning. It was the marking of a new day for us as a church. 5782, Tav Bet, was the marking. 2022 was a year of being marked. 5783 officially ends the Shemitah year and begins a brand new year of seven. It begins a brand new year of seven. Here's the other thing. When we look deeper into it, 5783 is a jubilee year. It's a 50-year mark. What happened this year that started 50 years ago? Roe versus Wade was overturned at a jubilee year, at a year where God begins to release life into a nation. He begins to release life into the church. It ends a cycle. The overturning of Roe versus Wade was a jubilee. It was saying those who have been held captive, the unborn who have been held captive in a nation, I'm flipping the script in 5783. I have a few saved people this morning. I have a few. I can work with a few. So then the way God has always spoken to me in these studies is that he then says to me, and, and this would go against some of the, my, my, my theologians. He says, look up 5783 in the Strong's. What is the Strong's number 5783? Okay. You ready for it? It means to be exposed or to have revelation. It means the cutting of the hair, the removing of that which is dead. It means to behead the enemy that you've aroused from its sleep. The church has awakened an enemy, but it's awakened an enemy. It literally means to draw the snake out of its den for the purpose of beheading. Cut it off. It means to draw the snake out to be head, to awake, to arouse from sleep. It means this. It means to tell Leviathan, come out, come out wherever you are, because your day is over. The spirit that's been in operation in our nation since 2020 has been a Leviathan spirit because you see how it has twisted relationships. It has twisted words. It has caused people to believe a false narrative. That's what Leviathan does is it comes to twist the word of God just like the enemy came to Jesus and says, I tempt you, and he used the word against Jesus, but Jesus came with a greater word, and this is a year in the decade of our mouth that we come with a greater word to the enemy and we stop allowing the enemy to twist the words and we start speaking truth and we start declaring, no, I've got the truth. I have a better word. I've got a better word. And here's the one that got me, y'all. You ready for this? It means to dig. I had no clue that in the Strong's Concordance, when you turn to 5783 and you go to the very bottom of that word, that one of the transliterations of that word is dig. That's what we've been doing. We declared this is a year to dig, that we were going to dig the wells of revival. And before we even knew it, God had already prepared that for 5783, that it's a time to dig. The word gamel also means, and I love this, justified repayment. Justified repayment. So I want you to say this phrase with me. It's time to go forward. That's the prophetic word for this house. In this season of restitution, recompense, revelation, and digging. That's, that's the four. I know there were three keys on the ring. 
So for me, recompense and restitution qualify as one. Because they, although they have slightly different meanings, they qualify as one. The second is revelation. And the third is digging. Those are our three keys to go forward in this season. God wants to unlock our city. He wants to unlock our lives. He wants to unlock the gates that have been around us. And He's going to do it through recompense and restitution, revelation and digging. Exodus 14, verse 8. Say it again. Go forward. It is time to go forward. You cannot let your past hold you back any longer. Exodus 14, verse 8. You ready, Hector? We're going. So the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. What did I say that word means? It means to draw the enemy out. As the children of Israel were going towards their promise, it drew the enemy out of his palace. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside whatever that word is in front of Baal Siphon. Pai ha Rabashango Rabasata. As Pharaoh approached the sons of Israel, looked, and behold, the Egyptians were coming after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will perform for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you will never see them again ever. The Lord will fight for you while you what? Keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to what? Go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and reach out with your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and through his horsemen. I could preach hours just on that passage. But I want to say to you this morning, in the decade of your mouth and in the year of going forward, while the rich man is chasing us down to give us the recompense, to give us the restitution, you need to understand something. You cannot stay in Egypt any longer. You cannot look back at your past like the Israelites and say, at least back there we had some cucumbers and some leeks and we had some things back there that we loved. And even though we were beat every day and even though we had to work for a taskmaster, at least there we had some cucumbers. Listen, in the wilderness there might be some manna, but I've come to the equipping church to tell you this morning, you better go forward in this season. You better move on. You better go forward. If there is one principle I live my life by, it's this, Philippians 1, 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I don't care what devil in hell wants to chase you down. I don't care what enemy of your past wants to speak to you and try to convince you that you're going to get stuck. I've come to prophesy to the equipping church this morning. It's time to go forward. It is time to go forward. From the very moment of being saved, this rule of Christian life is activated. He who began a good work in you will perfect it. That God is unfailing in His love and His commitment toward me and His commitment toward you. He's unfailing. We don't serve a God who has ever failed at anything. He set the world in motion and He will see it through until the day of His return. Whatever He promised, no matter what circumstances come, what pressures attack, God will complete what He started in my life. He will complete what He started in your life. No matter what the enemy swings my way, He cannot overcome this principle. When you understand that that principle is working in your life, He who began it 
We'll see it through. The enemy cannot, he can swing all he wants. He can chase you down. But I'm telling you, there's a Red Sea about to close on the enemy. There's a Red Sea about to overtake the enemy. And I'm telling you, you better move forward. This was a principle that the children of Israel could live by. That God had promised to deliver them. God had promised them a land of their own. God had promised it. So that whatever might come their way, they must inevitably and ultimately succeed. It doesn't matter how long it was going to take. God would have His way. If God said it, He will do it. And so what happens? They stand at a hard place. Death is behind them, and as far as they can see, death is before them. They reach this place where they're saying, we've got the enemy drawn out of his palace coming after us, and there's a sea in front of us. We're not seafaring individuals. We don't have boats. We don't have any way to cross this sea. But there's a sea in front of us, and there's death behind us. What do we do? And there's no good choices there. And so many times in our lives, we reach the rock in the hard place. And we don't see any other choice. We don't see any other way out. We begin to look at our circumstances. We begin to look at our past. And at that moment, Egypt didn't look so bad. Because what they understood, Pharaoh let us go. He's not going to bring us back. He's going to kill us. The enemy who is after your life seeks to kill you. When you get free from him, he doesn't want to just take you back into bondage. He wants to take you out. That's why in this season, the season of the mouth, the season where Leviathan's been drawn out of his cave, because you need to understand this. When Leviathan's drawn out of his cavern, he's coming with a fight. He's not coming to show off. He's coming to show out. He's coming to take you out. He's coming for a fight. And there will be many in this hour, unfortunately, who will bow to that... And be taken out. Bishop Dino said it to me. If he said it once, he said it at least 20 times while I was with him. Not everyone will make it through the deep waters. And I'm like, why does he keep saying this? And I understand it. I get it. Because when you get to the hard place, Egypt didn't look so bad just then. I mean, the atrocious attitude. Verse 11. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt? that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So many people say, it would be better for me to serve my porn addiction than to have to deal with the loneliness I feel as I'm getting through the wilderness. So many people would say, it's better for me to just live in sin because at least I'm comfortable there than to be uncomfortable outside of my sin as I get to my promise. And yet God calls us out of Egypt to the place where He can display His glory so that we know, I didn't deliver myself. I couldn't get free on my own. But God who makes a way where there is no way is the one who brought me out of Egypt. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will perform for you today. For the Egyptians who you've seen today, you will never see them again, ever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. See, the enemy wants to shut your mouth against the word of the Lord. What the Lord wants to do is shut your mouth against the word of the enemy. There are times to decree a thing and see it established. And there's times you just need to shut your mouth. Because I'll tell you what, when we get into these binds and we get into these hard places, it can be so easy to turn to a complaining spirit. Well, well, pastor wasn't there on Wednesday night. I don't need to be here for there to be a move of God. You need to be here for there to be a move of God. Because if I'm here and you're not here, well, then I'll enjoy the Lord all by myself. But it takes the church. We want to shift a region? Stop complaining. You want to shift a region? Don't jump overboard because things get difficult. Uh. 
And God's word stands true for them. And it does for us. Tell the sons of Israel, go forward. God's way is always forward. Forward from pain, forward from loss, forward from disappointments, forward from disillusionments, forward from failures, forward from mistakes. And we can, we just got to move forward. You can't stay in the past. We can spend all day rehearsing the past and allow those regrets to disempower our confidence to make future decisions. Some people, the only reason they've never moved forward is because they can't move past the past. And they rehearse it over and over and over and over again. And you know what they have? They have a spirit of replay. It's an actual, I've cast it out. It's a spirit of replay. It's a spirit that comes and plays the record over and over again. Well, they didn't love me. They just didn't love me enough. You've got a God who loves you enough. Of course they didn't love you. They didn't go to the cross for you. No one will ever love you like he does. And the result of those regrets disempowering our confidence can only ever be further disappointment and hurt. The danger is to consider that what we had in the past is better than what we have now. Because hindsight, friend, is not 2020. It will never be 2020. You can look back at your past and all your accomplishments and everything that looked good in your pride and in your arrogance, but when it's put up to the scale of eternity, you realize that's all rubbish because you built it yourself. Well, I was serving the Lord when that happened. I don't care. You're not there anymore. I preached this in Florida. I thought I was somebody in 2018. I thought I was somebody. I had the nations calling my phone number. Come preach these big conferences. Come preach these big conventions. But you know what was happening in my home? My wife was sitting in our bedroom crying because I was never home. You can think you're somebody and really be nobody, even in worldly success, which we often call ministry success. Let me tell you, ministry isn't that glamorous. The people who you think love you the most actually hate you the most. They just don't tell you. Like that's just what happens. But let me tell you something. When we keep our eye on Him and I press on towards the high mark of the call of God, when I press on understanding that He who began the good work in me is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, He's the one that sees me through. They allowed the children of Israel this temporary setback to color their thinking concerning the future. Oh, we reached a difficult spot. We're just going to die. No! This is the prophetic challenge for you and I. Transition is always hard. I don't care if you like change. You start messing with your normals, it's going to be hard. Well, I change my bedroom around every month. I don't care. You start attacking some of the things on the inside. See, some people, they like change so much because they've never dealt with the inner thing. That's just a symptom of an inner thing. It is often difficult to see where we will end up and can cause us to wish things were as they used to be. There's a difficulty when we're in the middle of an assignment to see the future because of the warfare over the current assignment. God says to them, leave Egypt. I'll make a way where there is no way. Get out of Egypt. Not only am I going to get you out of Egypt, but I'm going to cause Pharaoh to give, him, give you all of his gold and silver. I'm going to cause him to give you all these things. And, I'm, and then you get to a sea and you're like, oh, I guess there weren't enough graves back in Egypt. Come on, church. I'm preaching to myself this morning, okay? If I'm rebuking anybody, I'm rebuking myself because I know that I can get an attitude. I know that I can get an attitude. But see, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, For we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. I can't be moved by what I see. I see a red sea in front of me and God sees a promised land. Wherever you are in the continuum of transition, your walk is a walk of faith. As a revival church, we are in the continuum of transition. And listen, when revival breaks out, there will still be another battle. When revival breaks out, there will still be more change. Because you know what? Revival is messy. 
You know what revival does? It goes fire, 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 burn it all to the top. And then we get an ex- examination of what's in us and we go, oh, turn the heat down. I liked it better when I couldn't see all the stuff that was at the bottom. I'm good just being a little glittery. I don't need to shine like gold. Just give me a little glitter. I'm okay with cubic zirconium. I don't want to be a diamond. I don't want the pressure. I don't, I, don't, I don't want the irritation that's formed. You know, pearl is formed in irritation. Gold is, is really its purest form when it's been through hell. And I know some of you are going through hell right now. Keep going. Keep walking. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. I don't set up tent in the valley of the shadow of death, but so many people want to set up tent where there's been death because it's more comfortable. Because then I'm close to the memories. I'm close to Egypt. Come on, somebody. Your walk is a walk of faith that sees God is on the throne of your life and circumstances. That God has a plan for your life, even though you may not see it today. And maybe all you see is the potential for death. But listen, transition is empowering when embraced. Transition is empowering when When embraced, we must position ourselves to possess what God has for our future. That God is positioning this church. I I want you to hear this this morning. I'm not speaking to a nation, even though some of this prophetic word is so applicable to America. I'm speaking to the equipping church. Because if more than ever, I recognize a pattern that's come against this house. You want to know what the pattern is that comes against this house? We start to get on the heels of revival and then people start manifesting and they jump ship. And they don't want to go the long haul. Well, listen, Pastor Anna and I, we're going to keep driving the bus. We're just going to keep driving the bus. We have a destination ahead of us, and you're going to get on, and you might stay a while, and you might get off. But let me tell you, I know the places that we stop. You don't want to stop there. Because we're going through hell right now. The warfare is real. Some of you, the warfare is so intense. But let me tell you, if you'll press past the warfare, you'll taste revival. If you'll press past the emotions, you'll get the inheritance. If you will just let God move on your behalf, He'll part a Red Sea and you'll cross over on dry ground. But some of you are so stuck that there's an ocean in front of you. You're saying, oh, it would have been better to go back to Egypt. But let me tell you, Egypt isn't that appealing when you get to the promised land. God is positioning this church so that we go from bearing fruit to bearing extravagant fruit. Do you, you, you need to understand something. In Egypt, the Israelites cultivated the ground. They did. They grew their cucumbers and their leeks and their onions out in Goshen. That's what they did. But God was taking them to a place where they didn't even plant the vineyards. He was taking to them to a promised land where it took two men to carry a bundle of grapes. I don't want to just bear fruit. I want to bear some extravagant fruit. Listen, do we need to be mobilized to win souls? You better believe it. You need to win souls. You're a disciple. Wins, pack this place out. I can't do it on my own. And you can't do it on your own. we got to do it together. But in this season of going forward, we need to recognize there's a harvest in front of us. And while we're all tied up in our mess, people are going to hell. And you've got the answer. John 16, verse 21. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one is going to take your joy away from you. I've never given birth to children. Ever. But I can tell you, I've seen the difference in my wife's eyes from the last push and the holding of the baby. There is nothing more glorious that I've ever watched than watching Anna receive one of her babies into her arms after the tremendous labor that she's been through. Because I can watch the shift in her eyes from pain to purpose. 
Nothing more scary to me than when that baby's on the outside and I recognize, oh, I'm responsible for that thing now. <laughs> While it was inside of her, I can take care of her because it's just one. And y'all know we have a whole gaggle of kids back there. But here's the principle. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. Now, I know some of y'all have horror stories of delivery, and you could tell moment by moment how you punched your husband in the throat because he said, are you okay? You know, I, I know that there's some of those stories out there. But you can't disagree with me that once you get that baby in your arms, all the pain, you don't remember it anymore. It's like, oh. 2021 for this church was a year of birthing. We were birthing something new, coming to Sunday mornings, changing the name to the Equipping Church. But I want to tell you that we are in verse 21 now. Our hour has come. Our time has come for now. Not postponed, now. We are pregnant with tomorrow's potential. People can be robbed of God's potential because they shrink back from the cost. Revival is costly, folks. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you dying on the cross on a daily basis. I rec Listen, it's easier to just go preach for somebody else. Because I blow in, blow up, blow out. It's easy. I, I'm, I'm not joking. But here, we're plowing. We're, plow we're digging. We're digging. And that's work. And it's messy. I don't like working on, I don't like my hands to be dirty. I, I'm a little OCD over it. I was working on the car yesterday and I'm like, oh, I should have put gloves on. I don't like it. I can't help it. That's not what I was, I was created to preach. When, you can ask my mom. I never stopped talking as a child. I always was talking. So that's what I was created for. I was not created for working with my hands. But here's the deal. When we're digging for revival, it's messy. And you know what you encounter when you're digging for revival? The bones of past revivals that want to speak to you and say, stop digging. There's a great image that went around Facebook uh, a while back. And I meant to, to have it this morning. But there's a guy and he's digging for diamonds. And he's one strike away from opening the cavern and he turns away. And there's another guy walking past him who with one dig was going to access the diamond mine. We're one dig away, church. Don't give up now. Don't give up when our hour has come. Don't, Jesus said to his disciples, can't you just pray with me for one hour? Can't you just do this? I, I, I'm getting ready. I, I don't know when we're going to do it, but I'm going to call a 30-day fast. I, I don't know when. God hasn't given me the timing yet, but I'm going to call a 30-day fast. And what I'm going to do Monday through Friday is I'm going to open up the church at 6 a.m. And anyone who wants to come to pray from 6 to 8 a.m., I'm going to open it up, and we're going to fast for 30 days, and we're going to pray, and we're going to sanctify ourselves. We're going to consecrate ourselves because I believe our hour has come. I believe our hour has come. Is it costly? Yes. Has it been postponed? No. People can be robbed of God's potential because they shrink back from the cost and the failure and the need for change. You need to change. I need to change. God's dealing with me all the time. He uses my wife to do it. Hallelujah. That's why he brought her into my life. Graham Cook tells a great story about these hecklers that used to show up to his meetings. And he got so angry at them. So angry because they'd show up and they'd stand outside his meetings and they'd say all these things that weren't true about him. And one day he was so angry and he said, God, I'm just so tired of them. And God took him into an open vision. Took him up to heaven and said, come sit on my lap. Graham is sitting on the father's lap. And he's watching as these three, uh, uh, he couldn't see their faces. They were, they were chiseling away at this marble figure. And they were making this beautiful statue. And when they were done, Graham goes, that's me. And God goes, yeah, look at who they were. And it was the three hecklers. God was using them to chisel away at the things that need to be dealt with. Difficult people, God sends into your life because He's chiseling away at you. Don't get stuck on them. I've had to learn over the years, my hecklers are the ones God is using to chisel away at the things that don't need to be in my life so that I might be like Jesus who was like a lamb led to the slaughter and said not a word. People will slaughter you. 
They will. But I serve a God who operates in resurrection power. And you know what Job said? Though he slay me, yet I will praise. Sometimes the one doing the slaying is God. Sometimes he needs to slap us around just a little bit. I've been, I, I've got, I bear the marks of the slaps of God. Hallelujah. But let me tell you this. That if we won't shrink back from the cost, and we won't shrink back from the need for change, we will position ourselves from the future, for the future. So how did the children of Israel do it? What are our keys this year? In the decade of the mouth and the year of walking forward. Here's your first key. Number one, look forward. You, you can't go back and change the past. No matter how hard you try, you don't have a time machine and God's not going to take you into the time-space continuum like back to the future and change things. It's not going to happen. So stop it. Look forward. It is past and must be let go of. But if there is one thing that I'm holding on to in this season, it's this verse. Joel chapter 1 verse 4. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. But then what does it say in Joel 2? Then I will recompense you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust. My great army, what? Which I sent among you. All the stripping away all those years, all those things that you thought the enemy had stolen from you, actually some of it God just stripped away from you. Your pride, your ego, your arrogance, all that. I'm just preaching to myself this morning. Friendships, people, those things that got stripped away, what does it say in verse 26? You will have plenty to be eat and be satisfied. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dwelt with you wondrously. Then my people will never be put to shame. How many of you are ready for what was stripped away to be restored? How many of you are ready to move forward, to walk in? The rich man's chasing you down with recompense and restitution. And I need a people who aren't going to look back and say, when are you coming? You just have to go because what does the Bible say? There will come a day where the plowman overtakes the reaper. There's coming a day where harvest and sowing will catapult together. They will culminate in a moment. Some of us just need to keep going forward. Keep moving forward. Don't look at the past. Go forward forward hallelujah see in God's restoration Haggai 2 9 says this the latter of this house will be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts and in this place I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts so not only do you need to look forward here's key number two do something the command to the nation was what go forward where where are we going he's about to part the seas do something for them, defying all human logic. Yes, they had the promise, but the reality was, we're going to drown. We're not seafaring people. We haven't seen an ark since the day of Noah. What do we do? Go forward. The children of Israel had to position themselves by stepping toward the danger, but at least it was going forward. And it's better to go forward than return to the past. It's better to go forward than to do nothing. I read a story this week in, in one of my devotionals. It's the story of Joe Simpson and Simon Yates. Back in 1985, Joe and Simon climbed uh, the western face of Siula Grande. It's a 21,000-foot peak in the Peruvian Andes. And with the two tied together, the trip took to the top. It took three days. And they passed mostly without incident. So they got to the top, but on the way down, Joe lost his footing. He fell, and he shattered his leg, breaking the fibula and driving it up through his kneecap. That's an injury. For a while, Simon attempted to stay with Joe, lowering him in 300-foot increments by using two 150-foot ropes tied together. But Simpson slid silently over an unseen cliff hanging in the air. And with his full weight now on the rope, Joe was unable to lower him any further. Simon became convinced that Joe was dead. And he cut the rope. Because all he had was dead weight on him now. 
And there was no way he could get any lower without cutting the rope. So he cut him away because he was now slipping and losing control. But here's what happened. Joe lands on a crevice, or sorry, lands on a ledge in a deep crevice. He cannot climb back up, and he has two choices. He can choose to accept death or to lower him down into the abyss with the chance that he might find a way out in the depths. He cannot see what's ahead of him or below him. He's on this ledge. His, his knee, his whole leg is shattered with, the, with it through his knee. And he's laying on this crevice or on a ledge in a crevice in the dark. He cannot see what's below him. But he lowers himself into the depths knowing, without knowing what was at the end of the rope. He felt that if he ran out of rope, dying by falling would be the best way to go. He thought to himself, it's better I fall and just die than lay here and starve to death. Get this. He finds bottom and then sees a light. He crawls to it and into the day. He's still thousands of feet up, miles away from camp. To get there, he will have to drag himself with a shattered leg miles over a glacier and then over a rockfall. The distance and the scale of the task is overwhelming. So he limits his targets to 30 feet. He says to himself, I will make 30 feet in 20 minutes. And this is how he, with no food and no water, travels for four days. All the while, he can hear the water running underneath him, underneath the glacier. And six days after being cut free, he makes it back to base. 30 feet at a time. 30 feet at a time. I mean, what incredible endurance and determination concerning that moment in the crevice where he made the decision to lower himself further into the darkness. This is what he said. We must keep making decisions. I was so scared going deeper, but the other option was to just sit there thinking it would get better. You get that this morning? I'm going to say, I'm going to read that again to you. I was so scared of going deeper, but the other option was to just sit there thinking it would get better. How many of us so often with our injuries, with our lost relationships, sit there on the ledge thinking, it'll get better. It'll, I'm dying, but it'll get better. I have no community anymore. It'll get better. I'm bleeding out. It'll get better. One of the stories I read about, it was the fact that it went through his kneecap that it blocked an artery. Otherwise, he would have bled out. I mean, the perfect injury at the perfect time. The reality is that we must do something. We must do something. For Israel to do nothing meant death and imprisonment. And to do something meant death, but possible deliverance. To do nothing meant death and imprisonment. But to do something meant, meant death, but possible deliverance. God always has your deliverance in mind. He who began the good work is faithful to complete it. And here's the third thing. Activate your faith. Activate your faith. I want to read verse 16 and 17 back to you again. This is what it says. As for you, lift up your staff and reach out with your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea. On what? On dry land. Somehow, despite all we see and all we feel, we must confess the promise of God. Mark 11, 22 and 24. This is Pastor Anna's absolute favorite verse. She says it to me all the time. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, 
all things for which you pray and ask. Believe that you've received them, and they will be granted to you. If you want to know faith, talk to Pastor Anna. I'm telling you, she is a woman of incredible faith. In the midst of incredible adversity in her body, in the midst of incredible challenges, that woman inspires me on a daily basis. So don't ask me to pray for faith. Have her pray for faith. Faith contradicts so often our circumstance. It defies natural logic. And it seems crazy in the light of what we're currently facing. Despite all of that, God is a good God. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. And guess what? When you wake up tomorrow, he'll still be the same. I want to say to you in this decade of the mouth, watch what you say. Guard your tongue. It is the rudder of faith and the rudder of disaster. I'm not talking about get fake. I, I don't do the fake stuff. How are you today? Oh, I'm just blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. That's fake. Because you don't feel blessed and highly favored. Am I right? We, we don't do the positive confession thing, you know, that the world teaches. Manifest it. That's demonic. Let's get real so that we can get healed so that we can actually make confessions out of real faith. I don't believe in faking it till you make it. But let me tell you this, the Word does work if you work the Word. When you get the Word working on the inside of you, and you begin to transform through the renewing of your mind, and you get the Word in you, that confession, I am blessed and highly favored. That becomes real. But don't just say it to say it. Activate your faith. Because God has good things for us. And in this season, in this season, as we are stepping into a year that officially ends the Shemitah year, that ends a season of judgment. That's what a Shemitah is. It's a judgment season. We've seen, where does judgment begin in the house of God? And we've watched as God has gone, whoop, 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 whoop. And thankfully, we've been spared, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. But what I'm telling you is that we're crossing over. We're crossing over. It's a jubilee year. You know what jubilee is? Debts paid off. How many of you need some debts paid off? Come on. Jump around, spin around, shout hallelujah. Ready for God to do it. Pastor Hector, can you give me some music back there? Do you know how to do that? Do something. That's, that's what your wife said. <laughs> Aren't you glad we can have fun? Oh, look it. The nations are literally calling. I'm preaching. No, I'm preaching. God is speaking to the equipping church in this hour. He's beginning a new work. He's beginning a new work. Let me tell you, I feel like personally I've come out of the grave. And I think so many in this room have felt like they've been in a grave. And we're coming out of the grave. We're coming out. We're coming out. We're coming out. Recompense. The reward for loss. Things that have been lost in the last several years, God's rewarding. Restitution. The restoration of that which was lost or stolen. Revelation. Beginning to see what God is doing to dig. I almost bought everyone shovels and then I thought, no, I'm not going to spend church money on shovels. <laughs> they were more expensive almost than the real ones. I thought about ordering toy shovels for today. I'm like, China's gotten expensive. Will you stand this morning? How many of you ready? How many of you are ready? The keys have been handed to us as a church. The keys have been handed to us as a church. Pastor Kim said to us, your cry has to be heard at the gates. Okay? He's given us the keys to the gates. Through a series of God events that I can't even explain. Did you get 
that when I looked up what it means, it means to cut the hair. Anyone catch that? It means to cut the hair. Keys cut my hair. One time. One time only. My edge up was crooked. <laughs> After two hours. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Look forward. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a new day, church. When I woke up this morning, I was reminded of the story of Samson. And that's not a that's not a story that that I think is often preached even correctly, if I'm gonna be honest. Everyone makes him out to be this great hero. He was full of lust. He was a mess. But there's a, a portion at the end of his life. It says, And Samson felt the hair begin to tickle the back of his neck. Some of you are gonna start to feel the hair tickle the back of your neck. You're coming into restoration where the anointing's coming back on your life, where the joy of your salvation is coming back on your life. Some of you are going to enjoy church like you've never enjoyed church before. I'm telling you, I, I can feel it. There's going to be such a joy in this place as we step into revival, as we step into restitution. Someone said the other day, any church who claims they have revival doesn't have it. And I thought, brother, you ain't got it. <laughs> you don't even go to church. I'm telling you, we've got a revival atmosphere. I can feel it. I can feel it in the atmosphere. Here's what we're going to do this, this morning is we're standing. I want us to stand to give this morning. Can I have the ushers come? We're going to sow into this word. We're sowing into recompense. We're sowing into restitution. Your tithes belong in the house of God. Your tithes belong in the house of God. Let me make that clear. We believe in tithing here. Maybe not how some of the others teach it, but we believe in tithing. We believe that it's a biblical principle that we must live by. But today, I, beyond your tithes, and you know me, I don't do this. I want you to sow into the new year. I want you to sow into 5783, believing this is the year for recompense. This is the year of Jubilee. At the end of a Shemitah year, they would bring an offering and they would say, I'm being set free. This is the end. This is my Jubilee. I want you to sow into that this morning. You know me, church. I, I don't do this. But I feel something prophetic on this this morning. We're going to sow into this this morning. If you need to text to give, can we put that up? If you're watching online this morning and you want to sow into this, you can go online. The link's there. You can sow this morning. But I want to tell you this morning, he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. Let's, if you're giving by, however you're giving this morning, just lift your offering to the Lord. Every eye closed. Let's not look around. Lift your offering to the Lord this morning. Father, today we thank you that we're going forward. And that as we sow this morning, we're going forward into the things of God. And I thank you, Father, for recompense, for restitution, for revelation and giving. Father, we prophesy we've been given the keys and we will use the keys. We will use the keys to open the city gates. We will open the gates of our church, the gates of our lives, and we will see revival at the equipping church. In Jesus' name. We pray that your life was impacted today by the presence of God. For more information about the Equipping Church or to give online, please visit www.equippingchurch.us.